Happy Sabbath again. It's time to get into the Word of God. Amen. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of time to spare, so we're going to go directly into the Word of God for this morning. We want to thank those of you who have come out um, today. It's full. This is the way church is supposed to be. Amen. Look around and everybody's here. And if there's somebody not here, they're online. Praise the Lord. John chapter 13, verse 13 through 17. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And the Bible says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Mm. Title of my message for this Sabbath, Dirty Feet. Dirty Feet. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. You, O oh Lord, are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. You know, I got up this morning and I bathed and I got dressed. I was in a hurry. Um, on the Sabbaths that I come here, I also do a worship service online on Facebook. Matter of fact, you can go online and catch that message as well. And rarely, if ever, is that message this message. So it won't be double dipping. Amen. But I, I do that, and so I was racing. I put my clothes on because after I finish that, then I've got to jump in the car and head here. But I stopped on my way out the door because I remembered it's communion time. So I went back inside and did something that I probably wouldn't have ever thought of doing. I went back inside, took off my shoes. Not that my feet were dirty, because you know that would be atrocious. But I took off the socks and I lotioned my feet. <laughs> because nobody wants to come to communion with ashy feet. Matter of fact, I know folks who, when they know ahead of time, that's why some people cringe when they hear, oh, it's communion Sabbath. Ah, didn't get that pedicure. Why? Because we, we want to make sure that when we get to communion and we take off our shoes, we don't want people talking. about what's inside our socks. <laughs> Matter of fact, what takes primary thought is the communion table and, and the sacraments that are there. But I'll tell you what's in the back of everybody's mind is that foot washing thing. We've never gotten really comfortable with the foot washing. During this time, here's what goes through most of our minds. We've been in church all of our lives. We've done it all of our lives. We know it has something to do with baptism. 
But most of us are trying to figure out, couldn't we just get around not doing this part? Couldn't, can't we, you know, kind of, yeah, because, you know, it's just, there's water, and then there's pudding, and then there's, there's and then here's the other thought that you're thinking. After service with the washing of the feet, you see the pastor and the elders come with their hands. And you start, mm, I may just have to skip this time. Title of my sermon is Dirty Feet. Where in the world do we get this? Where did it come from? Besides what we hear in John, is there anything else about this thing that, that, that gives us some indication what's going on here? Where do we get this fascination with feet and holiness? What do those have to do with one another? Well, I want to tell you a little about where that is, and then we'll wind up where Jesus is. But we start off, first time we notice that God has a fascination with my feet is in the book of Genesis. Where Moses, who has been wandering the desert, for 40 years taking care of sheep, minding his own business, he sees that, that, that bush that's burning. And he goes over to look, and as he gets close enough to notice that the leaves are on fire, but the bush is not burning, he hears God say, take off your shoes. Why? For the place where you stand is holy ground. And right then, there's no more explanation for it. There's, there's nothing that we hear anything, but we start to sink in from Genesis that feet and holiness have something to do with one another. Then we roll on in and God is outlining the job in the book of Exodus. And by this time, God has a system that is set up in which the priests are to catch the blood from the sacrifice. Now, the problem is that when you cut a lamb's throat, Lambs don't bleed neatly. I want you to get, there's some practicalities along with that. These are, this is what priests are going to be doing all day today, put, put, putting the hand on top of the lamb as this person pronounces its sins onto the lamb and slits the lamb's throat and catches the blood. And the lamb is splattering. Incidentally, for those of you who are revelation buffs, this is why when John sees the one riding on the white horse. It says his robes look like they've been dipped in blood. That's because the priests, that's exactly what they look like. So you're carrying this blood and you are literally going in to the building where the Shekinah glory is, is, is there. It's, it's just behind the wall. You can see the light emanating and it's just behind the wall. And surely if the desert with Moses became holy ground, you know this is holy ground. So between and you're carrying what represents mankind's sins. And you get sins on your hands. You get sins on your garments. You better believe after a day of carrying sins, you get them on your feet. 
So between where the altar of sacrifice is and, and the, the, the holy place, there is a laver. And the priests were to get in and wash, take off their shoes and wash their feet because they were going into the sanctuary where God dwelled to get rid of mankind's sins. Are you starting to see? We're in the book of John, and it's John chapter 13, and I don't know if you've ever noticed. Keep this in mind. John writes this some 50 years after the event takes place. John is a teenager when Jesus calls him. And this event took place then. John writes this after he's left Patmos. And he's the only one still left alive when he writes it. But I, I want you to notice that John's memory, this scene is seared into his memory. And he's telling this as if he's watching the video of it. Matter of fact, in this chapter, he gives an announcement like he's giving a promo for a movie. Listen to it. Verse 1 says, it was just before Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Do you hear it? And now as he begins to talk about the event he talks like somebody who is retelling the, one of the major events of their lives. Just short, powerful sentences. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Are you there? John wants you to be there. Now remember, remember, every time we get into the book of John, we're reminded John intentionally said, I'm not going to show you miracles here. I'm going to show you signs. And any time we replace the word signs for miracles and for events that take place, it's letting us know this is a story that talks about the ministry of Christ. You remember us talking about that. This is the story. I wonder if you hear it and if you notice it as we go through communion, listen again for it. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. I'm in verse 3. And that he had come from God and so was returning to God. Verse 4. So he got up from the meal. Stop. Jesus, knowing that the only way mankind was going to be saved was through him. He got up from the throne. Took off his outer clothing. He took off his robes of righteousness. Wrapped a towel around his waist. Wrapped himself in human flesh. 
After that, he poured water into a basin. He poured his life out as living water. For are you seeing this? Jesus is extremely intentional about every detail that takes place here, which brings up a problem. I don't know if you noticed it, and, and maybe you wouldn't notice it because we live so far away that, that we just assume that this is the way it's supposed to be. But you remember the story. Jesus told his disciples, go Follow somebody who's got a basin on their head. They're going to lead you to a house. Go to that house. Go up and say, where is the room that the master has prepared? And you'll find the room. Come back and we'll all meet you up there together. You remember that story. Those of you who are biblical scholars, you remember all of that. But here's... Here's the part that doesn't make any sense. Everything is prepared exactly the way it's supposed to be, but something's missing. The servant. See, what, what we don't understand in modern technology and, and in modern days is that when, when you had an event like this, especially something like Passover, listen to the pastor, there was a servant whose job it was to wash everyone's feet coming in. Now, for you, that, that doesn't mean very much unless you're like those folks who make people take their shoes off at the door when they come into your house. If you could hire somebody to make sure people took their shoes off at the door, you'd probably do that. Take your shoes off. Anytime we go in there, you, you might be thinking, in the back of my mind, this is just my playful mind, it's, it's thinking, for the place where on thou sent has just been vacuumed. <laughs> that's, that's, our, that's our equivalent, but, but it was an important, it was not a luxury job. It was the lowest job you could have, but it was essential because back then, people were not wearing shoes. They wore open-toe sandals. And they wore them everywhere. Back then, people did not ride bicycles. They did not get into and out of a car. Come on, some of you, especially some of my ladies, you know you have a pair of shoes <laughs> that you wore so that we could see your feet in all of its elegance here at church. But you know you got that other pair. You got two pairs because you are not driving home in those heels. None of that was going on. You had, if you were lucky, you had sandals. If you were not lucky, you went barefoot and the bottom of your foot was the sandals. All day long in the hot sun and in the desert and after a while your feet start to sweat and after a while the dust starts to cling to between your toes and you coming in my house with that? Oh, no, this was essential. It was essential to have this servant who did this. So why would the God who makes everything intentional forget the servant? You know what I think? We have to wait till we get to heaven. And as we're sitting around that table, we can ask him for certain. Jesus gave the servant the day off. He intended it. 
Peter, James, and John had no idea, but they walked in. They just assumed the servant was running late. He's going to show up here in a minute, but, but now all of the disciples are here, and their nasty, smelly, dirty feet are in the midst with, with stuff caked on from mileage and everybody's looking at everybody's feet, and you don't even have to look hard because the smell is rising up, and we're getting ready to eat dinner. <laughs> and ladies, you know, it's just like men to look at the elephant in the room, and nobody says anything. Because it had been one lady in the room says, um, one of y'all gonna have to wash some feet. Nobody says, it. everybody knows it's supposed to happen, but nobody opens their mouth at all because everybody doesn't want anybody thinking I'm low enough to bow to you. Now, now get it, I, I'll bow to Jesus all day long, but you... I will not humiliate myself. So they left the mess on in church. He sat across the aisle in church with the mess still on in the presence of the God who told Moses, take your shoes off, for the ground where you stand is holy. The ground was holy only because he was there. The meal, John says, is over. They ate like many of us do every Sabbath, with crusted feet. If the priests would have walked in with all of that mess on them, they would have been stricken. But the God of the Shekinah glory here veiled in human flesh gives mercy eats with them. And then, picking up, taking off, putting on the loincloth, he comes, gets the basin. The basin was there. The labor was there. Just nobody wanted to. I'm just this way. I, I think a little different. Nobody even thought to wash their own feet in the presence of the king. They left it. They left it on. And John, it's seared into his memory. He's, he's watching as this takes place. He's watching, and it, it means so much more to him as he's writing this and seeing it. This is the John who saw the visions in Revelations, and now it's all coming together. And that John is writing this story, and as he writes it, he wants you to understand that this is important. Because just like them, we've been washed. We've been washed in the blood. We, we've been taken care of. We've, God's salvation is assured to us. I only got one amen. I said God's salvation is assured to us. Praise God. He died one time. For the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, his blood was spilled and it still washes, it still covers. Amen. Praising God for that. 
But day to day, I don't know about you, but my feet get a little dirty. Day to day, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm, I'm less than patient with my daughter. Day to day, I don't know about you, but I get a little frustrated with how particular my wife is about how my side of the closet looks. <laughs> maybe it's not you, maybe it's just me. Day to day, dust collects. Dust collects. Some of y'all were collecting dust on your way into church. Day to day. And because I know on this Sabbath, even more than other Sabbaths, I'm going into the presence of God Almighty. It's important that I wash my feet. We're almost done. We got to get to my favorite disciple. I love Peter. Peter starts with his brain on fast forward and his mind, his, his mouth is on fast forward and his mind is on stop or rewind. But he's going to say what's on his mind regardless. So when it finally comes, Jesus has washed everyone's feet. He starts with Judas. And he's washing, he's washing, and finally he gets around to Simon Peter's feet. And Simon says this, verse 6, he came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, you want to wash my feet? The emphasis isn't on my. The emphasis is, is on you. You're going to wash my feet. John's the youngest. He could do that job. But you're going to wash my feet? Jesus, don't you know the rules that a, 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 a master could never compel a disciple to wash the master's feet? And you're switching it up and you're going to wash my feet? Peter, we got to do this. You're not in control, Peter. You're not in control. Peter says, no. It sounds real humility, doesn't it, for Peter to say, God, thou shalt never wash my feet. Sometimes, what sounds like humility is really pride in disguise. This is the same Peter who, when Jesus said, I'm going to go to Calvary, Peter stands up and says, for God forbid, we're not going to let that happen. Why, you're the Messiah. What Peter really meant was, I'm not going to have any Messiah of mine talking about getting crucified. And neither am I going to have any master of mine washing my feet. Translate it, my feet are good enough. That's okay. I'll just come back next Sabbath when y'all are not washing feet because my feet are okay. The dust I've collected, it's all right. No big deal. I promise you, I'm good enough. And Jesus says, if I don't get to do this, you don't have any part with me. My brothers and sisters, I need you to understand that this ordinance that we call the ordinance of humility is not an add-on. It's not a nicety. 
It is essential. Why? Because what God, Christ does when he gets down and he begins to work on our toes, he's getting rid of that stuff that grows to become those cancer cells we were hearing about. See, Jesus is the dandelion of heaven. And he says, I'm the only way to get in here and work that thing through. Thank you for that, sis. Thank you for that. I'm the only way who can get in here and work that thing through. Because what you collect every day, it's not just okay. It's got to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus as well. He says, I got to wash your feet. See, but Peter's nervous about Jesus washing feet, just like you and I are nervous. Some of us, we will wash everyone's feet. I don't have any problem with that. I roll up my sleeves and I'll wash this person's feet. I'll wash that person's feet and I'll sing hymns while I do it. But I'll keep my own shoes on. I want to step close to you and help you to understand something. The ordinance of humility, sometimes the humility is not whether or not you will serve. Sometimes the issue is whether or not you will allow yourself to be served. Some of us, we can be Martha all day long and we can feed and we can take care of and we can minister and we can go and we can go. Pastors get like that. Well, we're going and we're doing and, and we're, we're, and it's okay if I don't eat. It's, it's okay if I don't get my needs taken care of. It's okay if I'm counseling everyone else and I won't take counsel for myself. Why? I am the pastor. I, I. And the truth of the matter is this. We need one another. And there are spots in your life that you can't see and can't reach. And you need folk who are willing to get down close, even when you didn't get a pedicure. I know it's, it's embarrassing. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. But I want to let you know what Jesus says if you can't. Allow yourself to be served by someone else. You don't have any part with me. Why is he such a stickler on that? Here. He emphasizes it afterwards. Jesus comes along and says what we read. He says, now I want you to notice I'm doing this. I am your master. You call me master and I'm supposed to be your master. I am. And there is no servant that is better than their master. So if the master can do it, so can you. Do you know what this washing of feet represents? It is Christ forgiving sins. It is Christ actively saying, I release you of the sins that you're holding on to. So if Christ can get down close to offensive toes and let it go, you my servants must do the same. The washing of the feet is humbling for the one who bows, but it's also humbling.
for the one who allows. And it's perfect because both come away clean. Now, just in case, just in case you think the symbol is enough, I want to remind you, Judas got his feet washed while the water was crystal clear. It's a symbol, but the symbol doesn't work unless the same access that I've given to my feet, I give him to my heart. Church of the Most High God, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to prepare to be vulnerable and allow someone else to represent Christ for you and wash the stuff that's collected since the last time you let Christ get close to what's between the toes of your life. And at the same time, I want you to be that person. Prepare yourself to be that person for someone else. With our eyes closed, we come, Lord, recognizing there's stuff that's collected recognizing that there's embarrassment that's collected. Recognizing, Lord, that there are some folk I just don't want to touch because the junk between their toes is what they did to me. God, it's painful to realize that with Judas already having betrayed you, you stopped to make sure that Judas knew this can also be forgiven if you just give me your heart. So Father, here in this silence as we prepare to transition, some of us, time does not allow. We've got to go home. But for the rest of us, Lord, prepare our hearts for the place whereon we stand is holy ground. Cleanse our feet. And then, Lord, Come in, wash us on the inside with the blood of the lamb and may the bread that represents your body be an invitation for your presence to live within our hearts. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.